right, folks, well, welcome to our session today. Um, we appreciate you all being here. You should have just gotten a notice that the session is being recorded. Um, and then I've also turned on live transcripts. So if you need captions, uh, those are also available. Um, oops, I already, there we go. Okay, <laughs> so uh, welcome to our workshop today. It is, uh, we're gonna talk about ungrading and alternative grading hopefully emboldening you and your students to improve. So my name is Matt Kreit, I use they, them pronouns, and I'm a teaching and learning specialist here at CTRL Center for Teaching, Research and Learning. And I'll let my co-presenter introduce himself. Hi, uh, I'm Adam Temeshaski. My pronouns are he, him. I'm faculty director of the Complex Problems Program at University College. And I'm also with the Writing Studies Program, which is housed under the Department of Literature. Um, and I have been practicing ungrading since fall 2019. Perfect. All right. So as we get started, um, we want to start with a little warm up uh, chat. So in the uh, chat, you can go ahead and introduce yourself, your pronouns, if you'd like your department and then share uh, in reflecting on your uh, experience as a student. Have you ever received a grade that was at odds with your learning experience in the course? Briefly describe it. So this could be an instance where you got a grade that you didn't expect. Uh, because of the amount of work that you did. It can be a, a grade that you were hoping for that you thought uh, you maybe didn't work as uh, as much for really anything where you got a grade that didn't represent how you experienced the class. We got uh, Hannah reflecting that they earned A's uh, in undergrad courses where she didn't feel like she learned so much or retained uh, anything long term, but knew how to play the game to get the A. So I think that's a that's a situation that maybe some of us have experienced as students and maybe some of our experience our students are currently experiencing right where you kind of know what to do to get an A, but maybe you didn't retain much of that content. Has anybody else had a similar experience either in this kind of this direction or uh, maybe the opposite direction? We got some folks who, who it's been quite a while since you've been graded, which is totally fair. We got some folks getting uh, lower grades on papers because they maybe disagreed with the, the argument for the paper. I think that's uh, what's going on. I am a virologist by training. So anything outside of science, I am <laughs> outside of my, uh, my expertise there. Great. All right, well, thank you all for uh, participating in that. And hopefully you can kind of uh, maybe start to see where we're gonna go with some of this workshop here which is that occasionally, you know, the grades that you receive don't always represent how you worked in the class or what you learned from the class. So we'll talk about uh, how to address that and some concerns that folks may have. All right, so I'm gonna go in through a little bit of uh, some guidelines for participation so you all can kind of know how to uh, interact in the class. And so throughout this workshop, we hope that you, you can stim, rock, fidget, knit, craft, whatever, uh, whatever you need to do as you need, uh, need it. We recognize that lots of different folks have different needs in the online space. And so we love seeing really any kind of engagement uh, that you are able to do today. We hope that you participate in individual and group activities in a way that works for you. We know that some folks may want to speak verbally, some folks may feel more comfortable in the chat, 
Um, and some folks may just want to kind of sit back and listen. So we welcome any type of engagement and participation that you would like to uh, that you would like to do. We'll also ask that you uh, ask questions and share your ideas in the chat. If you would like to verbally speak, uh, please do raise your hand. It is under the reactions tab at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And then finally, be generous with your knowledge and respectful of other people's knowledge. We'll also share some uh, outcomes for our workshop. So hopefully by the end of this workshop, you'll be able to reflect on the purpose of grading and how current approaches may or may not be serving students or instructors. Describe the value of various alternative grading methods in promoting an equitable learning environment. And then develop some strategies to address challenges related to alternative grading in individual assignments or courses. So with that, we've got a few different guiding questions that kind of have guided the way that we organize this workshop and will guide our session today. So we'll first start by asking the question, what's the purpose of grades and do they fulfill that purpose? We'll then talk about the effect, uh, what are the effects of traditional grading schemes on a variety of factors. We'll also talk about what are possible alternatives to traditional grading, so maybe the meat of what you were hoping to get today. And then finally, what challenges might come with or through alternative grading. So with that, I'll turn it over to Adam to go uh, go through the purpose of grades. Thanks very much. It's really, it's thrilling to have you all here um, and to, to continue this conversation with some of you I've begun the conversation with already and to meet new people to keep this conversation going. Um, it's really, it's, it's a privilege to be with you. So our, our starting question here is to get the, uh, the thing out exposed, which is why do we do this at all? Why do we have grades? And uh, what are they trying to do for us uh, within the classroom? And if we'll move to the next slide, um, these are some concise responses to the named possible purposes of grades from a great article that many of you might be familiar with. Um, Jeff Shinsky's and, and Kimberly Tambers Tanner's uh, teaching more by grading less or differently. In one of their sections, they name the four major purposes that people often offer as this is why we have to have grades or this is the value of grades. And at the end of each of their sections for these, these four suggestions, they summarize their main points that they make. And these points are made with a great deal of support, research support, scholarly support. Um, and we will be sending along resources to everyone here, um, including links to articles like this. And so this is meant just to be the beginning, perhaps, for you of a path to follow, um, where if you're like me and you're skeptical of all things, you're looking for the research that, that will back up the summative statements here. And this article will be where you can find scads of research backing up each of these, these elements. So, so to start off, you know, one of the suggestions is that grades are necessary because they give students a useful way of understanding how they've done. They give valuable feedback about performance. Um, and Shinsky and Tanner can sum up what the research has found by saying uh, the italicized portion here, grading does not appear to provide effective feedback that constructively informs students' future efforts. Uh, particularly true for tasks involving problem solving or creativity. Even when grading comes in the form of written comments, it's unclear whether students have even read such comments, much less understand and act on them. Uh, Mac in a little bit will be talking about some really important work by Ruth Butler um, that talks about the link between comments and grades and how it lands on students. But in short, it does not seem that grades by themselves are, are useful in students for gauging how they've done on a particular task. Uh, some of you might have had this experience in the past where you've did a lot of work on a paper and what you get back is a letter grade. And that's it. And a student doesn't know if they received a B because uh, points were taken off for mechanics or points were lost for argumentative weakness or evidentiary concerns. The grade then obviously says nothing about the performance. Uh, so that's the first possible purpose. Uh, the second purpose could be well, maybe what we need is motivation for students. Students won't do anything unless you have the cudgel of grades to get them to do things. Um, is it effective motivation? The distillation of lots of research to this says, rather than motivating to students to learn, 
grading appears to, in many ways, have quite the opposite effect. And here, just to uh, interrupt for a moment, this lays bare the most common belief that, that grading practitioners use, which is there is a valuable, clear link between learning and grading. Um, the first slide already began to take apart that because a grade by itself says nothing objectively about what a student has learned. Um, so does it do, do grades help motivate students to learn? It looks like the opposite might be happening. Perhaps at best, grading can be said to motivate high achieving students to continue getting high grades, regardless of whether that goal also happens to overlap with learning. Um, another interruption. Uh, scholars like Alfie Cohn will often say something to the effect of, students often can be said to have learned in spite of grades, not because of grades, um, which is another way of rewording that sentence there. Uh, finally, to finish, at worst, grading lowers interest in learning and enhances anxiety and extrinsic motivation, especially among those students who are struggling. Um, and one of the things the research will show you, and again, Alfie Cohn is a big name in this, this direction, the, the more students are rewarded for a certain behavior, the more they focus on the reward itself, not the behavior. And they'll begin doing the behavior for that reward. Uh, and so it may have been with the best of intentions that this incentive was offered, this extrinsic incentive of a grade. It will take their eye off the ball, if you will, and they'll focus on what do I need to do to get the grade, not focus on what do I need to do and why. And that, that divide gets in between learning and grading. Uh, perhaps there's another purpose for grades. Uh, maybe if we use a curve, it helps us allow student comparison in classes where perhaps we think it's necessary that students are ranked amongst one another. Shinsky and Tanner say this, one issue surrounding what they call norm reference grading is that it can dissociate grades from any meaning in terms of content knowledge and learning. Um, in brief, curve grading creates a competitive classroom environment, alienates certain groups of talented students, and often results in grades unrelated to content mastery. Uh, in other words, even the idea of grading lays bare what we've talked about already, which is learning and grades are not lockstep. They do not represent one another. Uh, if you're in a place where you can change the number that a student earned based on what other students earned, you've, you've already admitted that there is no connection between grades and learning. Now you're using grades even more subjectively based on who was in the class that semester, who took that test that day. Um, so curve grading leads to things like a competitive classroom environment where students begin to see uh, grades as if there is a zero sum game and I have to get a high grade, which means that I must take away from you. And if you get higher than me, I need to get what you have, creating a very hostile environment, which is antithetical to learning. Finally, Maybe all that aside, is it possible that grades provide an objective evaluation of knowledge? There is no surprise, I take it at this point, which is to say, in summary, grades often fail to provide reliable information about student learning. Grades awarded can be insist inconsistent both for a single instructor and among different instructors for reasons that have little to do with a student's content knowledge or learning advances. Um, just as a sort of an aside, I heard, for instance, today, uh, a student happened to be able to get a 27 out of 25 on one of their essays they turned in here at AU because they were given two points for turning the essay in early, which, of course, doesn't say anything about that student's mastery of the content or, quote, unquote, learning advances. Um, it just it's a, it's a tangible example of all the different things that can be built into a grade that are not about evaluating knowledge. Uh, finally, even multiple choice tests, which can be graded with great consistency, have the potential to provide misleading information on student knowledge. Uh, much of the research here will focus on things like, what was chosen to be on that test? Who did the choosing or prioritizing that sort of knowledge? How were the questions worded? Who made the choices about how to word the question? Uh, did you run the wording by students to see if they understood what you were trying to get them to answer? So even multiple choice tests, which are often sort of held up as, well, at least this thing is objective, 
have been shown to be quite fraught. All right, thanks, Adam. Uh, sorry, my <laughs> I'm using two screens and I can't find anything. Um, all right, so so we've talked a bit about right the purpose of grades and whether or not they fulfill those purposes. And I think Shinsky and Tanner and Adam and I would also would agree that they don't really fulfill these purposes, right? There's a lot of things that can go into grades that don't necessarily correlate exactly with the with the knowledge the students have grade gained. So let's think about what the effects of these grading systems are on a variety of uh, factors. So we're gonna talk just briefly about the effects of grades on mental health, on our marginalized students, on student motivation, student learning, and the classroom environment. And so I want to mention here that we're gonna talk about all these very, very briefly. Uh, it's just, it's meant to be kind of a brief overview we do have references in the slides so that you can look these up um, if, you'd, if you'd like to read more. Uh, and additionally, all of the slides and everything will be sent in a follow-up email. So you will have access to our presentation and our references. And I, uh, I at least am always happy to talk about ungrading and any of these references. And I, I probably can speak for Adam and say that he also will be. Um, so let's, let's start with uh, student mental health. So let's start with the bad aspects. Of, of kind of what's going on in the world today with respect to our students' mental health. So college students are juggling just like a dizzying array of challenges, right? They have coursework, they have relationships, they have adjustment to various different aspects of campus life, uh, economic strain, right? Like lots of students are experiencing homelessness or are unable to buy food. Uh, there's also a, a ton of social injustice, mass violence, uh, various forms of loss related to COVID-19. So it may come as no surprise that roughly 75%, so thir uh, over three fourths of students report moderate or severe psychological distress and about one in five, so about 20% struggle with suicidal ideation during college. And these are from relatively recent studies. We also see that some of these issues come as a result of grades. So about 70% of students state that they uh, experience anxiety and depression as major health problems for themselves or their peers. And about 88% feel uh, a lot or some pressure about grades. So this pressure that they feel surrounding grades and the evaluative process contributes to the, the negative mental health outcomes that they are experiencing. Additionally, about 80% or probably over 80% of college freshmen have the highest, uh, they rank their academic uh, competence as the thing that contributes the most to their self-worth. So if they are being graded on their content knowledge, that'd be great. But if they're being graded on their ability to turn something in on time or their ability to fulfill a, an instructor's, um, maybe to argue an instructor's point that they maybe don't agree with, like we saw Dustin talking about, they're basing their self-worth on their ability to do these things when there are lots of other things that they should that they can and that we'd prefer for them to base their self-worth on when grades are not necessarily that great uh, measure of academic knowledge or academic competence. So the good aspect of that is that we as educators can help allevi alleviate some of the stress for students. So research shows that teens uh, have higher self-esteem and lower psychological symptoms. So these are things like depression, anxiety, insomnia, et cetera, um, when achievement is not emphasized at all costs. So here, uh, the researchers recognized achievement as a proxy for grades and this achievement at all costs meant that every, you have to just kind of throw everything away in order to get that A. So, uh, so really it's not about not having students set goals or try difficult things, but more we need to recognize that there will be setbacks and that students don't necessarily need to completely burn themselves out into, in order to get those A's that, they're, that they expect to get or that they, that they need to get in order to progress uh, throughout the rest of their, their life and their uh, post-college experience. So now Adam's gonna talk a little bit about grades and marginalized students. 
Uh, we're also gonna be sending out uh, materials around this, including a presentation, which I'll talk about on the next slide about um, some grading equity work that we're doing over in the um, complex problems program. A couple of lines here that we wanna to point to are the ways that grades are playing out um, disproportionately affecting students who are um, not in the, let's say, traditional mold of AU college students, which is say most AU college students tend to be um, white, second or more generation at college, and English as a primary language. And so uh, some of the great work with labor-based grading is from Asao Inoue, um, who's, who both of his books, I believe you can get for free, um, but we'll link you to those. But from one of his books, he, he very clearly explains, this, particularly in writing courses, how grading, uh, because it requires a single dominant standard, is a racist and white supremacist practice. And, and as a writing studies teacher, this, is, this was my entree into the entire ungrading, alternative grading uh, world. And quite, you know, put quite simply, when you are holding students up to, quote unquote, academic writing, what you're holding them up to has been the language that has been gatekept primarily by uh, white gatekeepers through the, the academia, through the academic institution. And so that, that's where no way is coming from, right? What are our standards that we're using to say you are deficient if you don't match this standard? And that's uh, in a way's approach from there. We also have um, from uh, Botello et al, black students have lower teacher assigned math grades than their white classmates. And this sort of discrimination and this inequity doesn't just stop at our academic gates, um, just as a sample of the way that this unconscious bias that can creep into the grading ecology can also creep into other things down students' roads, um, famously in hiring practices. So as Bertrand and uh, Molly Nathan point out, job applicants with white names needed to send about 10 resumes to get one callback, and those with African-American names needed to send around 15 resumes to get one callback. And this is just sort of setting the stakes of the kind of inequities that can creep in, creep in unconsciously, whether it's grades, hiring, and other elements of society. Uh, I want to tell you about something that, that will be on your radars, I hope, through the years as we keep um, trying to broaden the scope of this. We'll send out the link to this presentation that we've done. Uh, Becca Comfort and I, Becca is the program manager of Complex Problems. But in short, we discovered that uh, within CP, and we're not alone in this at AU, at higher ed, or at um, any other, other educational level in the United States, that there was a disparity between how grades were given in that non-white students were not earning as many A's as white students in complex problems courses. And so to look into this, we assembled a committee to really dig into the data, make sure we understood the data, ask questions about it, all of that work led us into a presentation we gave at Ann Farron in this, this January, and we're working on the next steps. Another group of faculty has convened. We are going to get our own disaggregated data. Uh, so you can see within your own history here at AU, how have your grades shaken out across the demographics that we're talking about? The hope that we can begin this conversation. Why might my grades be distributed as they are? What elements of my grading practices uh, might be places where inequities have crept in? And how can we support one another in addressing those? And that is the Grading Equity Project. And again, if you wanna learn more about that, we will be sending along a link to that presentation um, that breaks that all down. We'll also be inviting faculty members, staff who are interested to join us on this journey as we keep working. We envision this as a process, a multi-semester process of collegial support. Um, what's happening in our classes and what can we do and how can we support one another? And I'll just note, I have put that link to the presentation here in the chat. Um, but again, we'll send that follow up email uh, that many of you are familiar with because I recognize a lot of uh, familiar names that will have all of this stuff as well. So overall, kind of the argument that we're trying to make here is that grades decrease students motivation to learn enjoyment of learning and curiosity. They promote less interest in learning a preference for easier tasks. Right, because if you want to get that A, you're going to do the easier task as opposed to that maybe more creative or interesting task that may put you in a little bit of a of an experimental um, position. And then again, shallower thinking. Uh, they also make students more risk averse, less willing to try out new concepts or techniques, which we might even think of education as the best place for students to be able to try out these new concepts and techniques. 
because there should be uh, this kind of safety net and less um, less consequences to trying something out that's new in the education classroom as opposed to in their jobs or in their future uh, careers. They negatively impact student mental health, as I mentioned on those first few slides. They can increase competition among peers if you're using things like norm reference grading, right, grading on a curve. Um, and then they can contribute to damaging and antagonistic interactions between students and instructors. I think many of us will have had an instance where a student um, did not get the grade that they wanted. And then you kind of have to have a, an unfortunate and uncomfortable conversation about, about that grade. And maybe we'd rather be having conversations about our course content, right? Because we all really love the things that we teach. So why not talk about the content that we, that we enjoy teaching as opposed to some uh, nitty gritty about grades. So again, we have a bunch of references, could not fit them all on this slide. Uh, so when you get these slides, feel free to access those uh, later. And then as Adam uh, alluded to, uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit in a little bit more depth about a particular landmark study from Ruth Butler and Mordecai Neeson. So what happened in this study is that students were put into one of three groups and given a task that was ranked previously as highly interesting. So group one received only a grade on their, on their task. So they did the task, they got a grade. Um, group two got a grade, but they also got feedback on how they did on that task and how to improve. And then group three got feedback only. So they did this task once, they got this grade, grade and feedback or feedback only, and then they did a similar task again a little bit later. And what the research found was that group three, so that group that only got feedback was the only group to show consistent improvement across a few different tasks over time. They also found that students in all three groups preferred the evaluative conditions for group three. So what that means is that if students were given the option to choose either a grade, a grade and feedback or feedback only, they preferred the feedback only condition. So what this suggests to us as educators is that feedback alone is key to student learning, improvement and motivation. And sometimes a grade can uh, reduce someone's ability to take in that feedback, right? Because you get a grade, you see, oh, I got a B, cool, that's what I wanted, I don't need to improve anymore. Or, oh, I got an A, great, I have nowhere to go with my, with my writing or with my ability to develop an experiment. And so sometimes those grades signal the end of that learning process. And what feedback signals is that the learning process is still ongoing. Things are still happening. There's still things that you can improve on and still things that you can adjust as you move throughout your educational experience. So what we want to do now is ask you all, have you seen any instances where students may discount some feedback in lieu of the grades that they've gotten? So you can share that in the chat, or if anybody has an experience that they'd like to talk about, feel free to raise your virtual hand and we can call on you. I can mention a specific experience I had when I was uh, a graduate TA during, um, during my PhD studies, which was that I was really trying to give students uh, really great feedback on some papers that they were writing. So they were writing a, essentially a lab report, but in the format of a typical uh, research paper. And so I gave them, you know, this really like really detailed feedback on all of their drafts. Um, but they all got 100% on every draft because I wanted them to turn in those drafts and then apply that feedback later on. What ended up happening, unfortunately, is that at the end of the course, a lot of students were really, um, did not implement that feedback. <laughs> and then they were like, well, I got hundreds on all my drafts. So that means I did great. Um, even though, you know, we kind of talked about that with them. So we have this kind of tension between the grade and the feedback that they were supposed to hopefully able to uh, implement. So we also have a few notes in the chat. Right, so at the end of the semester, people are overcommitted and they check the grade 
book and maybe or maybe not open up the comments and maybe or maybe not look at all that extensive comments that you give them as an instructor, which maybe even feels a little bad, right? Like you want your students to improve, spend a lot of time giving them that feedback, and then it's just kind of discounted because they got the grade because uh, the grade is already there. So seeing. Right, so even on, so Matt's mentioning on final uh, assignments, exams, assignments, papers, whatever, students are kind of just ready to get out of the class. They're okay with the grade that they got and they, they're not really looking to improve uh, in future semesters or in future classes. Uh, Robert's mentioning when they offered individual feedback and in office hours scheduled at all students' convenience, got, uh, got no takers, right? So you get a grade, and you don't really prioritize that feedback. Um, Adam, is there anything you'd like to add here? Yeah, you know, um, th this is something that that caught me by surprise. When I moved over to uh, labor-based grade, I'll talk about that in more con concrete detail in a moment, but I, I knew from the research, I spent, after Inoue visited AU, I began doing the research and thinking about moving over to my system, to the system, the research had told me all the different ways that students would benefit. And so I was sold just for that. What I did not expect is the very first time that I sat down to go through a stack of papers and I began to write my comments, I realized that my chest felt so much lighter because I wasn't writing to justify the grade. And even though I never consciously thought about that's what I was doing, I knew that students would be comparing the grade to the feedback. And if it was not an A, they'd be reading the feedback only through the lens of what does he think that I did wrong? And I realized that on my end, I had this wonderful chance because I was just giving them feedback truly as feedback, truly as this is my opinion. I am not trying to justify any grade to you. And if it were a lower grade, that was more and more explicit in my mind. And it was a real benefit because um, I think it was Garrett, you had mentioned earlier, what a, what a heartbreak to offer all this feedback, you know, and in writing studies, I'll, I'll take between 30 to 45 minutes on average to, to write my feedback. That's after doing the marginalia. And if a student would just bypass all of that, you know, that's a significant portion of my life that I gave away for no, no good reason. So just for that mercenary side of things, um, I found a real benefit for myself in it. So that's, that's why I, this, this question made me think about, because I definitely, you know, there, there's a famous book in the, in the academic circles simply called What'd You Get? And it's about students' fixation, because that's the question that they walk out asking each other, not, hey, how strong was your argument? Or, hey, did you use evidence effectively? But what'd you get? And then you get the grade, and that's the end of the conversation. Um, yeah. Great. So with, with this in mind, let's think about what are some possible alternatives to traditional grading. So what we have here are the kind of the four that we're going to give you all brief overviews to. Um, I also am going to drop in the chat here uh, CTRL's newly developed uh, resource on alternative grading. There's a lot more detail about these different topics, about these different types of grading, as well as, again, some more references because we love references here. Um, so what I'll note is that we'll talk about ungrading, contract grading, specs grading, and portfolio-based grading. These are only a few of the multitude of alternative grading strategies or techniques that you may have seen folks employ. Um, additionally, sometimes the terminology can be a little bit confusing. Um, in doing research for this presentation and other presentations, uh, I'll see people describe kind of things differently. So they'll describe contract grading as I've seen other people describe specs grading. Um, so the, the important thing here is that regardless of the name of the alternative grading system that you use, um, all of these alternative grading systems, sorry, give me one sec. Okay. Oh, I'll start my mouse again. Um, all of these systems uh, prioritize the process over the product. So they prioritize the learning process over what you actually produce. They value self-reflection and metacognition, which can help our students become self-regulated learners, can help them uh, begin to learn for learning sake as opposed to for that grade. Um, incorporate feedback 
in revision. So incorporate that feedback over time and improve over time. And then finally, increase clarity and transparency around the evaluative process, right? So lots of times we see folks not understand what they need to do in order to get the A, and I used air quotes there, uh, get the A. Um, and so a lot of these grading practices will help students know exactly what they need to do to get the grade that they're working for. So the first system that we're going to talk about is ungrading. So ungrading may be used as just an umbrella term for all of these alternative grading systems, but it can also be a system where all grades essentially come from student process letters. And I'll talk a little bit uh, about what student process letters are. So these are essentially reflective letters where students write about the learning process. And they can have a wide range of questions that you ask students to answer or respond to. But essentially, it's getting them to reflect on that learning process, what they learned, what they didn't learn, what they still need to learn, questions like that. Um, ungrading also allows uh, students, again, to focus on that feedback, both from their peers and from their instructor and that revision process. Uh, importantly, in ungrading, students can kind of start from any level. So they can start as a maybe as a proficient writer and proceed towards an exemplary writer or they could start as a novice writer and proceed towards maybe a proficient writer. Um, and so then they're progressing towards these learning goals as opposed to some arbitrary standards that we have set. And then finally, we sometimes see that uh, ungrading works, works quite well when students have intrinsic motivation. So you may find that in courses where students don't have quite so much intrinsic motivation, such as in a required course, that this grading system may not work as well for you. However, it still can, right? So these are things to try. These are things that uh, could work in different situations, may not work in all situations. So that process letter that I, that I mentioned um, is just an instance where, again, students will reflect on the learning process and think about the process of developing their assignment, a paper, doing an exam, uh, whatever. So we suggest kind of scaffolding these process letters over the semester if this is something that you're gonna implement. Um, so essentially when students are first assigned them or first begin writing them, uh, they should be more guided with specific questions. And we have a bunch here, um, such as, did you learn anything expected? Uh, what seemed useful? What didn't seem useful? What stands out to me? What makes me wonder? Uh, what did I learn about how I learned? So some of these questions can help students figure out what they're learning, figure out what they're interested in, and figure out kind of where to go next in the semester. Um, so at the beginning, right, you're going to scaffold them and guide them with a few more specific questions, and then they can even become more open ended over time, right, so you can just assign a process letter and say, hey, write about your learning process and once students have learned how to do that, they can then apply that in other contexts uh, in, in their lives. Now we're going to talk about contract grading and Adam's going to take that. As it as it gives away by the title, contract grading says to the students, look, I promise you this will be the grade that you are in the final grade that you earn um, if you meet these essential labors of the, of the course. One of the things that's interesting about contract grading, and this kind of touches on the idea of, of the process letters, one of the popular ways of getting to that contract is in conjunction with the students. So asking them, for instance, what do you think would be the ideal uh, labor required to earn this level of a grade and this level of a grade? And if you have the time in a semester, and this is um, where you might be pressed in, in ways other courses aren't, but if you have the time to set up that meta conversation, so students are thinking, yeah, what, what would average work look like in here? What would above average be? What would be deserving quote unquote, um, such as grades carry that idea that some grades are deserved um, of the highest level, for instance, and getting them to think about that. Sometimes what you can do is come in, and this is this is more akin to what I do now, with, with the contract already ready to go, ready to explain what you came up with, but also quite open to feedback on it. Um, Asawa Noe, for instance, not only works with his students off of a base uh, sort of form of a contract and gets them up front to design it with him, but mid-semester they come back to him and think, all right, we, we've had half a semester under our belt. Is this working? What needs to be changed? Now, now that you've got some familiarity, does the contract need altering? So the contract comes out of you, comes out of you and the students, comes out of a, a work between them. 
And what it says is these are the labor steps that we need to do. It's not focused on subjective determinations of quality slash mastery. Instead, it's saying, if I ask you to do the right labors, just make attempts on the right kind of labors, I should still be able to get progress from you toward these directions. And the research has borne that out, that a teacher who wants to implement contract grading, arguably you need to have a very clear sense of what kinds of tasks get in the right direction. Um, anything that looks like busy work is going to sink the ship. Students will have intrinsic motivation when you are asking them to do tasks that they can believe in, they see the value of them. Um, you spend time pulling that curtain back to say, this is the value of what you're doing. This is how it will help you out. And if you give them that level of agency and background, students will rise up and meet you at that expectation for labor. Um, we'll talk about specs grading in a moment, but it's a little bit different. Specs grading does have more of a consideration of mastery, but, but in a way that's removed from grades being assigned to it. We'll talk about that in a moment. Contract grading lets students have that kind of agency. Here, here's a sample from a, a no ways sample contract that he gives out when he gives um, presentations. For his courses, the default grade is a B, right? If a student does the basic labor, as he says, if you do all that's asked of you in the manner and spirit it, it, it is asked, if you work through the processes we establish and the work we assign ourselves in the labor instructions during the quarter, if you do all the labor asked of you, you will get a B. Uh, importantly, it will not matter what I or your colleagues think of your writing, only that you are listening to our feedback compassionately. We may disagree or misunderstand your writing, but if you put in the labor, you are guaranteed a B course grade. Um, he goes on to note the ways that you may not meet labor requirements. If you miss class, do not participate fully, turn in assignments late, forget to do assignments, or do not follow the labor instructions precisely, you will get a lower course grade. And he uses a chart so that students can on their own see where they're going. This has cut down from, I can't even tell you uh, the, the percentage, it's basically zero of students who have emailed me to ask what their grade is because they can simply see on Canvas what is missing, what is late, what is otherwise marked as complete. And I have a chart that like in OA lays it out quite clearly. It is possible because students, of course, will be asking for perhaps quite good reasons, not just because the system has poisoned them so much, um, but because let's say they have a scholarship and they need a certain grade in that class. They need to know, can I get a higher grade? So in contract classes, there is almost always uh, extra labor that can be done. He says, higher grades in the default require more labor that helps or, support the, helps or supports the class. This for me is one of the many parts of genius of uh, what Inoue has given me. It's thinking of extra labor as everything should be thought of. How does it benefit the learning community that your classroom strives to be? So it's not asking a student to do another paper that only I read, to do extra labor that way. It should be outward facing. The student benefits, the peers benefit, and I, when possible, also can benefit as a learner and as a teacher of that class. Um, and so he lists the things that can be done to move the grade all the way up to, let's say, the highest grade of 4.0, which is also an A. Um, it moves for him by a third. And so in my course, where I don't use GPAs, 3.4, 3.7, 4.0, um, a B can become a B plus, a B plus to an A minus, A minus to an A. Or if the final grade, let's say, were, you know, at a, at a B minus, you can move that up that, that same way by these, these steps. Specs grading, uh, specifications grading essentially is saying to move up through the different tiers of grades, you need to get a certain number of satisfactory elements, whether it's assignments, quizzes, exams that are demonstrating mastery. Um, it's often called bundling. And so you might, for instance, say, well, you know, if you want to achieve a C in this class, it would be uh, two satisfactory essays, seven satisfactory homeworks, and 10 satisfactory quizzes. A B would just move those numbers up accordingly, and A would move those numbers up even higher. One of the upsides of this for faculty 
um, is that you can give feedback that is revision focused. It's the next project focused. And for students, they have freedom to fail and it's not fail and burn. And so they can just keep trying to get each element done as many as they can in the time period so that specifications grading really allows students the, the chance to try things out and if things don't go well, to try again without penalty. They are simply trying to reach the level of items within a bundle to move up that way. Um, as the slide says, baked into the process is repetition and revision. This is a sample of uh, what bundling looks like. Uh, Carolyn Schrader syllabus, Religion, Race, and Justice in the US, um, which has been shared publicly. And you can see how you move up through the different tiers based on doing more and more things at the satisfactory slash excellent level. Um, it's a relatively straightforward system for students to understand insofar as it's relatively binary. You can split it into unsatisfactory, satisfactory, and excellent. So there's a divide between I need to do this again and I've done it at a level that would give me credit or some levels um, offer excellent as its own sort of thing. So for instance, I might be able to have um, 10 satisfactory blog posts or I could have eight satisfactory blog posts and two excellent. So there are ways for you to find the freedom of making the bundles more interesting, more variable, but still giving the students, again, a chance to fail without getting burned by failure. Um, if failure costs them something, they will be so adverse to taking risks, which as Max said, is where real learning can happen. If they know that taking risks and having the freedom to failure is baked into the system, you will get students being risky and interesting and creative. Absolutely. And I think um, another thing to think about, right, is that if they can fail, they are more willing to just like enjoy the class, right? Like they can just enjoy the process of learning, um, which I, I enjoy learning. And so I hope I'd be able to instill that in my students. Um, so the, the final uh, alternative grading system that we'll discuss just briefly here is a portfolio based grading. So this has similar elements as some of those other grading systems that we talked about. But one of the things that happens in portfolio grading is that students complete assignments and then they get feedback and then they choose essentially which assignments they'll be evaluated on uh, at the end of the semester. So they complete assignments throughout the course of the semester um, and then they develop a portfolio. Sometimes it's at multiple points. I've seen folks that do uh, portfolios kind of at the midpoint and then again at the end of the course. Um, other folks will just do one at the end of the course. Something to consider with this is if you do end up doing a portfolio that uh, students compile at the end of the course, it is uh, a lot of grading that occurs at the end of the course, a lot of evaluation, a lot of feedback that you will be doing as the instructor. Um, so that that's kind of something to consider. Portfolios can be created uh, for usually for one of kind of three purposes. So one is to show growth, which is probably what I uh, encourage you all to, to think about. So showing improvement over time, right? So you choose some assignments where you didn't do quite so well. And then you also choose assignments where you, you really like the way that you uh, completed that assignment. And so students can show how they improved over, this, uh, over the period of a course. Um, they can also showcase current abilities so these may be things that we see for students who are going on to the um, uh, going into the job market, right? So a lot of times folks will develop portfolios that showcase what they're able to do. So if you're in a professional program or maybe working with graduate students, a system like that might work uh, might work really well for you because students can then use it outside of your course. And then finally, um, some folks will use these to kind of evaluate cumulative achievement. So it, the entire ability of you to do something. Um, so this may be something that you may also find important. Uh, interestingly, and I think importantly, these types of portfolios can include a variety of assessments and assignments that allow students to demonstrate their learning and their strengths through different means, right? So if we assign an essay and we assign a video, uh, video project, 
students can choose the one that they like the best and they can choose the one that they think they did the best on that showcases their talents in a way that they prefer to be evaluated on. Um, and portfolio grading, uh, the, the descriptions of portfolio grading do tend to be quite long. Um, so we've just provided some examples here that you all can peruse because you usually end up getting like a very long page to two to three pages worth of information about how to develop that portfolio. So what we're going to do now is move into some of these challenges that we might face as we move towards alternative grading. And I'll note that there's uh, there's been a few that folks have mentioned in the chat. And so I encourage you uh, as we uh, move into kind of this activity here to go back and review the chat and see if there are any challenges though that you have also seen. And we can uh, kind of brainstorm ways to address those challenges together. So for this activity where we're gonna kind of brainstorm challenges and brainstorm these solutions, what we're gonna ask um, is that uh, you all uh, either join a breakout room or you're welcome to uh, work individually in our main room here. We have uh, essentially what we have is a, a Google document that I just shared in the chat that has one column for a, alter a challenge that you may face as you implement alternative grading and then a second column that has solutions. And so what I'll ask is if you are in uh, breakout rooms um, to take about five minutes to talk amongst yourselves and contribute examples of the challenges that you might face as you think about or actually implement alternative grading practices in your course, then after about five more minutes, start to brainstorm solutions to the challenges that you generated and then also the ones that uh, other groups produced. We will debrief this activity together at the end, so we'll all be able to talk together. Um, and just to note, again, uh, you are welcome to stay in that main room if you don't like breakout rooms or it's not how you want to participate today, or you can go into the breakout rooms. Um, before I send you all, do you all does anybody have any questions? And there are sort of credentialing issues of uh, if we were to change our whole system. Uh, and people want to go to graduate schools, does our transcript, how does it compare with other universities? Uh, well, yeah. there are several undergraduate universities and institutions that, that don't use grades or use some modified version of grades and more and more grad schools, importantly, that are not using traditional grading systems, Stanford, Yale, Harvard, um, in part as they recognize the way that students are suffering yeah. at the stress of that grad level. And that that's part of the trickling down that we're seeing happen as sure, you're looking yeah. at, oh, the Ivies aren't using grades exactly. at graduate level. Well, then maybe we don't use them in undergrad. And then if we don't use them in undergrad, well, then maybe high schools will do it. And then, well, you know, perhaps <laughs> we'll get out of this. Um, well, finally, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's Ali Khan's passion. I've yes. yeah. read his things for years and uh, he, he's really run ran with this for some time. All right, everybody, well, welcome back. Uh, hopefully you all had a nice conversation um, about some of the challenges that you might experience as you start to think about ungrading. So I wonder if anybody wants to kind of share either a challenge that you couldn't address or just a summary of how your conversation went. Yeah, I'll jump in. Um, I had some good feedback in our, the breakout room and also in the chat. Um, I I put this in the chat, but I'm totally convinced on the why. I've I've been in academia long enough to know that grading is like the worst part. And even those of us who are trying to teach more collaborative thinking, it ends up pulling out the competitive mode, and it feels very transactional um, and kind of reduces a lot of the the deeper learning. So it's more a matter of the how, and then almost precluding the parental concerns you know if it's it's one of those things that once you're in it you realize all of its logic but from the outside it might look like it's um, undermining rigor and so I guess almost like does AU have a more a, a like way to introduce students to it as a legitimate and in fact growing pedagogy in a way that their parents can tap into and see and then the students maybe can even self-select or even if they don't self-select but once they're in that curriculum, not just kind of say it's this one, you know, this is one professor who's gone rogue, you know, but see that there's a whole movement and there's all this research behind it. Well, I don't know about 
a database that's publicly available of those of us who have, who have gone rogue, as you say. Um, this is a relatively good segue for me, what I had mentioned to Robert earlier, and those, those of you listening in this room. I have started a AU Going Grade List Google group. Uh, faculty members who are thinking about it, who have done it, um, and it's open to anybody. I mean, it's, it's truly a place where people can come, ask questions, go through what they're struggling, have support. Uh, as, as Mac pointed out, there is no one way at all to do this kind of ungrading work, the general ungrading work. And so people who want to modify it, talk to others. Robert has been doing it for many more years than I have and is, is much more of an expert on it. I'm going to lobby him to join the group. <laughs> um, and so like, there, might, there should be a place, hopefully, Garrett, where it says ask to join group. Does it not ask you to join the group? So yeah, so that's that's one thing we want to work out for you all. But but to the other point about AU support, I will say this thus far, I have gotten as far up and up the administrative ladders of Jessica Waters, who was our unfortunately outgoing dean of undergraduate um, education. But to to Dean Waters' uh, position and credit, she has been nothing but supportive and interested. She puts student welfare first, and this is very much a student welfare fair driven enterprise. So if the replacement, who we'll, hopefully we'll find out about in a week or two, maybe, um, if they follow on that spirit, I know that institutional support goes as high as that, um, which, is, which is quite high. Uh, Provost Starr knows I exist because um, uh, he used to be the dean of CAS and is now provost and has not come after me for that. So like that's my little hint that perhaps he's OK with it. Um, but yeah, like to your point, I think it would be lovely if this became much more broadcast and institutionally supported. But it's events like this and, and interested people like you um, becoming part of the movement, becoming sort of um, mini shepherds of it with the groups that you are part of and letting people know this is not um, shocking or, or truly revolutionary unless it's revolutionary to try and get learning centered in a classroom. I see I've given my hand away. I don't think it is. Um, <laughs> so yeah, that was my classic long answer to a beautifully short question. <laughs> um, one of the things I can point to also, someone had mentioned on that sheet, how do you, how do you practically do this in Canvas? Um, and the way that I've been doing it is, is quite simple. You just can make the, the drop-down menu um, complete or incomplete. And so I can I can do that as things go. And so let's say a student has turned something in um, and it didn't meet the labor requirements. I can give the, the feedback right there in easy grader. I can mark it as incomplete. They can go back to it and change it. I change that to, to complete. And students can very easily, this was another question about students who asked for their grades. Um, they can go and see, and I'm happy to share my, my, my syllabi if anybody wants to see how I do it. I use a... Um, annotated syllabus, which is, again, not my own idea. It's one of the ideas that I have gotten from the different circles I've, I've become part of in these, these last couple of years. Um, I'll drop, for instance, into the chat uh, one of my syllabi. Um, where was I going with all of this? Oh, yeah, my chart is there. And so students can see how many lates they have, how many missings they have, and they can hold it up to that chart. Um, is there a tech familiar... You know, that's a great question. I don't know of anyone on that end. Um, I can tell you that I would be delighted to help with whatever you ever need. Um, but I don't know anyone in, in campus themselves. Um, this is another nuts and boltsy thing that, that might be of interest to you. I got tired for the last couple of years of being the arbiter of if absences were justified or not. If a, if a student was yeah, if people are nodding like this. I didn't, I want to be a teacher. I don't want to be a police officer <laughs> for a lot of reasons. And so I went into the fact to the academic regulations and I read the language that said, faculty have the discretion to say at a certain number of absences, excused or not, a student can be fairly said to have not taken the course. So mm -hmm. I, in the effort to, as Robert was saying earlier, make everything binary, and I want to remove my subjective judgment as much as I can. Um, my policy this semester was if you miss seven classes, which is 
uh, what, 25% uh, of our 28, that suggests that that triggers the need to retake the course. It's not up to me. You, you can take mental health days, which in my mind, if you just need to not be in class A because you need to chill out, does AU consider that excused or not? In my mind, it should be. Now, I don't have to tell you if it's okay. No one has challenged that. Um, and if they do, I will simply point to academic regulations. You let me make this decision. And I think this is, this is actually the most important thing. On day one, the kids get the syllabus before class begins. But on day one, I explicitly read that to them. I gave them my, my logic for it. And I said, if you remain in this class, you are operating under the contract. This is part of the contract. Um, students loved it. They loved it. One student said, I think that's too many. I don't think we should get seven. I was like, <laughs> okay. Um, but I think they like it because they don't like, no one likes to be policed. And I'm trusting them to make the decisions on when they can or can't. And if cir circumstances have conspired against them to make them have to miss seven courses, that sucks. But also like, if they don't get what they need from the course, we the university believes that these courses are, are valuable. They need to retake it. It's not a punishment. And the university should work with them to get them what they need. Um, so yeah, that, that's my, my long explanation of, of another policy, which is very concrete um, and has gone well, especially most importantly for me, it's gone well with students. And I have not had anyone this semester, I just did all my roster checks today. Um, no one is up at seven. I have one student who has been having a heart condition who's at six, but I am working with them to um, deal with that. Um, but also, they expect not to miss any more. They think they got over that hump. Everyone else, the most I have is four across all three classes that I'm doing. 